So today we're going to be talking about five foolproof steps for creating an effective competency framework for your workforce. Have a wonderful guest speaker. His name is Yemi Fasheon. I've been in the privilege of knowing him for a very long time. Yemi is currently the head of human resources at FBN Quest Merchants Bank, one of, of course, our, one of the biggest banks in, in, in Nigeria. And uh, so Yemi, your experience, how could you just give us a brief Rhonda? I know we've type it out here but i mean co coming from as they say the horse's mouth right the <laughs> owner of the experience could you kind of give us some um uh, brief about your experience so far so yeah i did start my career in, in human resources i started as a salesman selling computers on the streets of lagos um so people have asked me if i get into hr by by accident or by design and i always say by by accident as soon as i go into <laughs> hr i knew i didn't want to leave hr so the first time I had some form of contact with HR was at Athrenus when I was doing executive selection and training. And since then, uh, the love for HR on a, on a career basis, and uh, it's been fun. At some point, I did leave HR again to go to sales at Standard Chartered. But after one year, I quickly ran back into HR. So it's been sales. I did some form of experiential marketing at Killer. Uh, before I fully settled into HR. And like I said, it's been fun uh, working within the space of HR. And, and my experience is um, it, it's cut across um, specialist areas, selection, resourcing, at some point, full-time training. But now, I mean, given the number of years one has grown in the career, I'm at leadership position now within the HR function. Um, the organizational leadership is about relationship management. Because you can't you can't succeed in HR if you don't if you can't sell your initiatives to executive management. So that, that's where I am right now. An end to end game from the HR space for me at this as well, the learning and development space. Excellent, excellent. So in HR, have you you've done more HR core HR, I would like to call it, and then L and D. Have you that a big mix of L and D as well as core HR? How has that mix been? For you um I, I guess it's enriched the experience so at some point like i say it was resourcing and then at some point okay so i, I always like to see l and d as one one part of the entire hr puzzle so l and d is quite important you, if you recruit very well you pay very well you reward very well but you don't develop people very well then the puzzle is incomplete so LRD is quite important for me. Mm, excellent. So you you haven't really had too much challenges, have you? Faced by or well, the challenges faced by employees in identifying skills gaps. You know that's one major challenge. Uh, how have you handled that? Um, so skills well, skills uh, gaps in the workplace, just, basically. Yeah. So it's not just an uh, HR responsibility. For as long as HR realizes that it's a process owner and people management is a primary responsibility of line managers, then working with line managers to identify those skills gap becomes a bit easier. But if HR sits at the head office or on certain floor and thinks that it can do everything for the business, I think that's where we see a lot of disconnect. So whatever okay. we want to do from the space of HR, including identifying the skills gaps, we need to work closely with line managers. We need to guide, we need to hold their hands, but it's a, it's a close-knit relationship between human resources and line managers. And it works, hmm. it really works. Excellent, excellent. So for today, what are we talking about? Uh, we're going to be talking about what is a competency framework and then five steps for building a competency model or competency framework. So that's the core of what we're going to talk about today. And we're, we're kind of lucky to have of course, lucky to have Yemi around to kind of guide us through his own experience in building a, building a competency framework. Because um, yes, theory is one thing, but experience, nothing beats experience. So while we move on, let me just click on the next, let's see. So what, are, what has everybody else's experience been? Who here has that experience of building a competency framework? Let me put up another poll and I would like to hear from us here in the audience. So the poll is coming up now on we, whether or not you use a competency framework in your organization. I'd like to know who here uses a competency framework 
in in the organization. So right now it's like 67, 33, 33% of us say no, we don't use a competency framework in our organization. We can now more 60% said no, now they don't use it. 40% use a competency framework in the organization. Okay, so it's more like, I mean, it's more like 60-40, uh, as in 40% say they don't use a competency framework, or wait, they use, okay, no, no, it's, it keeps changing, 43% say they use a competency framework. Uh, so it seems more people uh, don't really have a competency framework. What has, has your experience been when you join an organization, although you've kind of worked with top international organizations, so how has your experience been with competency framework, uh, Yemi? I, I think um, it's it's becoming more and more popular recently. Um, if I go back to my days um, when I started in the human resources function, sincerely, it wasn't a popular it wasn't a popular uh, template, not a popular concept. But as we realize the importance more and more of learning and development to the organization, and the need for people to be ready for the next levels not only in terms of what they do, but to get them ready for the next levels, then the competency framework becomes more and more important. So yes, um, if, if I'm looking at the results of the poll, I'm not surprised. Not too many organizations actually use competency frameworks, not too many. But like I said, in recent times, it's becoming a popular tool to make use from a skill gaps perspective and what the individual needs to do. As, as a matter of fact, in my organization right now, we've, we've integrated our competency framework into our performance management system. And you don't see many organizations do that. So it's getting more and more important as, um, as this field of human capital management um, evolves. Mm, so you, you currently use a balance scorecard too, don't you? Yes, we do. We use the balance scorecard. Uh, and uh, I guess you integrated with Oracle performance model. Is that, is that what you're referring to? Say that again. You integrate it with the Oracle. It's integrated uh, into, our, into our Oracle uh, um, system. Okay, super. So uh, that's very, I mean, so how granular do you get your data? So what's the benefit of, of that? It seems to be quite advanced. Well, well, the benefit of it is we just want, we just do not want to promote people based on tenor and um, based on feelings or rule of the thumb. Hmm. We, we work with life managers to determine exactly where the individual should be on the competency framework at the beginning of the year. By the end of the year, we also do a kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, analysis of where the individual is so that we see where the gaps are. Interesting to note that one of the ways we want to, we want to determine our ROI on our training budget is the percentage of competency gaps closed as a function of the training budget spent and that's how i measured it's one so of my percentage for this year mm, I, interesting. percentage of competency gaps closed mm -hmm. right as a function that. of the training budget spent okay so if i'm not closing 70 percent if i'm spending i'm just saying 200 300 500 million naira on learning and development but i'm not closing at least 70 percent of the identified competency gaps, then mm. I have not achieved anything from an NND perspective. Interesting. That, how do you that, measure that important for us? How do you measure the closing of the competency? How do you measure that the competency has been achieved? What what measurement tool do you use? Again, for now, I mean it's in, it's evolving, but it's a com it's, it's a conversation between the line manager and human resources at the beginning of the year. They have the we have the competency framework, they have it as well. And therefore they determine where every member of the team is at the beginning of the year on the competency framework. And when we do the performance dialogues on a quarterly basis, we do a check-in as well. And don't forget that the line manager has some responsibilities in terms of learning development to close the gaps identified at the beginning of the year. So as the year goes on, we are constantly checking where are we on the competency framework for individuals in every team. And at the end of the year, again, is it two sides? Maybe we don't have any particular tool, but the conversation between human resources and line managers, the conversations are on, ongoing on a regular basis. 
to determine how far we have gone in closing the gaps identified at the beginning of the year. Oh, so that's super. It's, in, it's really important that we have metrics to measure these things. So we will just be moving sure. along to see, okay, we have a framework we would like to share about. In doing a competency, building a competency framework or building a competency model, first of all, anything about competencies are really mostly technical or behavioral. So you have a skills gap or you have a behavioral gap. So we have the technical areas which we need to address which we have on the screen here. And then, of course, we have the behavioral and culture. Maybe we can say culture things. Is there a culture fit? What, uh, someone can be so skillful or technically competent, but uh, when he's, they have that behavioral issue, it can really be very septic. I don't know if you've had that right. experience. And someone is so good, but uh, he's really the behavior or she, she or the behavior is just not there. And it's really kind of makes the whole thing go, I don't know, upside down. I, I'm sure you've had that experience. At oh yeah, some always, stuff. always. I mean, mm. I mean, I was, I see two people um, as part of this conversation now. Uh, Imani Michael, one of my bosses in HR, and uh, Shegwa Kyode. We belong to a particular mm. HR platform, and these are constant conversations. Mm. Where do we draw the line in terms of defining talent? Is it the guy who's yes. shooting the lights out technically, or the mm -hmm. individual who's both shooting the lights out and also? role modeling the culture or the values of the organization. What we tend to yes. see most times is that we just lay emphasis only on the technical areas. But believe me, mm -hmm. my, the emphasis on behavioral competencies is, is, is more than, I put it that way. And I have seen in Sorry, guys. There's a, a there's a leadership line out there. there are gaps. There are gaps, and the individual is on talent correctly. We need to find that line of convergence between technical competencies as well as behavioral competencies and leadership as individuals move up the ladder in the organization. Yes, that, that's that's a real key. I mean, I run in an organization as well. I see see that a lot. It's a behavioral side to it, and what people say is you 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 recruit for behavior and you train for skill. So you recruit uh, someone Absolutely. based on the fact that uh, they can fit to your culture and they, they have that behavioral trait is already okay. Because if you recruit for skill and then try and change behavior, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I've learned that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how do we build a competency framework? That's what we're going to be talking about. How do we really build a competency framework? Well, we're going to talk about various five steps. And the very first step for building a competency framework is to prepare and communicate. That's the most important step or very first step is you need to prepare and communicate. And in that preparation and communication, really, you start off with things like planning. You need to, okay, at least plan uh, for a competency framework. You need to say, okay, what's important? You need to inform your workforce about it, your intentions. You need to do all of that very early on. Uh, you need to work with all the levels of your staff and make sure that it is very easy and accessible, use-friendly and, um, uh, and kind of user-friendly and implemented correctly is very, very key. So planning is, is key, uh, inform your workforce, and then also you make sure that it's collaborative. So whenever you're building such a competency or trying to build a competency framework, it has to be collaborative. Uh, I don't know in your experience, how has the planning process worked, um, Yemi? Okay, so um, because it's the first time we were implementing um, here in my organization at MBN Quest, we work with a consultant. And believe me, we did not um, have a situation where HR was just working in isolation with the uh, consultant. No, the consultant actually had conversations with every member of senior executive one-on-one -on -one, and also next level down. So that part of preparation and getting them involved from the onset, what you might call buy-in was quite important. It just set the tone for everything. So the preparation and communication stage is quite important. It should not be seen as another tick of the box HR initiative. The ownership of the competency framework should be the entire organization. And that worked well. That really worked well for us. So we, 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 we did not um, sit 
and then introduce this new concept to everybody. We actually carried everybody along from the onset as part of the preparation stage. How long did that take? How long did the preparation and communication step, how long did that take? It, it took about two months. Believe me, before we implemented our competency framework at the beginning of this year, we worked on it for a full year, integrating mm. it into our performance management system. It was a full year. We were not in a hurry because we needed to get it right. Excellent. And are you seeing the benefits, obviously, for that hard work? You can see the benefits, I'm sure. Two, two more. You're seeing the, you're seeing the benefits already directly um, sure. for that hard work of sure. one whole year. And, yeah. and the, when yeah. you are doing yeah. the preparation of communication, yeah. yeah, obviously you told everybody of the benefits of it, and now they can see the benefits of that investment. So that's that's the Absolutely. beauty of uh, planning and communication, which is the really the first stage. The second stage is you have to mm. define your competency requirements. That's the next stage. So step two is defining those competency requirements. An important step in creating competency framework is collecting data. One important thing is really you collect data. Of course, in your planning and communication, you already know that, oh, I need to collect a lot of data from different people. I need to do surveys of my employees and stuff like that. So there, there are quite a lot of things you need to do in that um, defining your competency requirements. As I said, collecting data is one key bit, collecting data uh, within your organization and all the stakeholders within your organization. And one way of collecting data within your organization is to actually do surveys. You survey, you survey the employees as well as management. So do critical surveys of employees and management, then you now determine your current skills gaps. Because after the survey and collecting data, that's when you understand the skills gaps that exist. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if uh, people in the audience, I don't know if anyone there has done surveys. Have they surveyed their staff before? Let me see. Let me just send out a poll. Um, have you ever carried out a competency survey of your employees? So that's the question that's on the poll, guys. And uh, if you just answer it, have you ever carried out a competency survey for your employees? More votes. I want more votes in. So currently it's 100% no. Nobody has carried out a competency survey. Is this typical? Uh, I mean, so we have 100% saying no. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I, I, again, no surprises. But I think what we leveraged on was the survey that had been done in other markets relating to our own sector, which is the mm -hmm. financial services industry. So we didn't start from ground zero without some data. So we had data of what was happening in investment and merchant banking business uh, globally. And then we had some data about what was happening also in our, in our local market. Interestingly, the consultant had some data that we could leverage on, and it was, mm -hmm. we started from there. But did we, on our own, uh, conduct any survey around competency framework? No, we didn't. With employees or with management? No, we didn't. We just leverage on data and the one-on-one -on -one discussions with the line managers and heads gave us some insight, some data mm -hmm. that we could also leverage on. But we mm -hmm. didn't commission a survey in that in that sense per se. I think it's usual for more large companies abroad that have like 100,000 staff or 50,000 staff. So that survey will kind of add value because in Nigeria, we don't really have as many staff. So a company that has 2,000 staff is considered large. That's considered pretty yeah. small in the US, for example, or the UK, where they have tens of thousands of staff. So maybe you're right. So basically, mm -hmm. you interview the line managers. Like, for, for example, for me, although it's not a competency model, more like when I'm doing a training, I'll go and try and survey the managers but, or ask the managers questions. But I also ask that participants is in that meeting. At least one or two participants are in that meeting so that I have a 360-degree mm -hmm. view of exactly where the issue is. And sometimes I see it's not really a training issue. It's more some other competency issue. It's not really a training issue. and They don't need to waste money for training. So that's your stage two, guys. Your stage two is you need to do kind of collect data by defining your competency requirements. That is step two. So we'll go to step three now. I've already asked the, everybody a survey. So step three is to choose a foundation. So we need to choose a foundation, the foundation of what that competency model will be based on. 
So the most comprehensive way to implement a competency framework is by using competency management software. Sometimes you use that. You have a competency management software that makes it easy for leaders throughout the organization to collaborate with the tool and stuff like that. So obviously, um, Yemi already mentioned something they use and they've integrated it into their performance management system, which is really, really excellent. So in that choosing a foundation, Typically, you would use a preset list. Maybe there's already, somebody has already built something, right? Somebody has built a competency framework, which is similar to what you have. And you have a, a, um, a organization's job types or competencies match those of that organization or the other organization. So using a preset list is a, it could be a basis for maybe expanding upon that framework uh, as, you, as you go around doing or creating your own solution. So that's one step. A preset list and of course you will now customize that preset list to kind of fit your own uh, framework this makes it cheaper really at the end of the day is a cheaper way to build a competency framework but most times some people just decide you know what we're going to build from scratch we're doing this thing we're developing a custom framework which i think is what eme did yeah, developing a custom mm -hmm. framework. yeah uh, that's very expensive uh, it takes a while Yes, it does. Um, no doubt, it does take a while. But again, because of the, um, you know, we're talking about about surveys, and we're talking about data. That is possibly one of the issues we have in our market. If we had not data that we could leverage on, they wouldn't have taken that much of a time, and we would have spent less. But because we, we really didn't have data to leverage on, um, so we had to build something from the scratch. But like I said, it wasn't because we built it. I, I didn't build it with my team i worked with a consultant and that really that really helped that really helped okay okay all right so for guys i'm going to play a video on a competency framework at least something that you could leverage on if you're building out a competency model so just watch this two minute very short video and we'll get back the competency triangle can help to explain the different types of competency whether knowledge skills or behaviors you may have within a framework Those competencies that are shared by most people, such as a level of verbal and written communication skill, or the ability to operate a piece of machinery that's generally available to all, are known as foundation competencies. In addition, there are likely to be competencies shared within an industry or profession, such as the health service or the financial services industry. For example, the way in which the Data Protection Act or other legislation relates to your sector regardless of the job you're doing. These are known as focus competencies. Moving on, there are then specific knowledge, skills and behaviours that apply to the way in which you carry out your role within the organisation. These are known as execution competencies. These three types of competency form the basis of your current competency level and are usually set by the organisation. In addition, there may be future and often personal competencies relating to your future role. The next step competencies that form the basis of your development plan for the future. These are likely to be a combination of personal and organisational competencies and are known as potential competencies. Finally, there are other skills, behaviours and knowledge that you aim to have in the future. Likely to be personal rather than organisationally set, these are known as aspiration competencies. Great. So that video was talking about the well, the competency triangle. So just talking about the competency triangle to help to explain the different types of uh, competencies in a framework. So I hope you guys gain something from that. And where, while we're there, as in we we're just talking with Yami on how this framework in general, it, it's very critical for an organization to build a really good competency model because everybody every organization is kind of different in a way every even though they're similar they, they're they're also different so developing a, a custom framework is, is is a good thing and that's one of the steps so that's step three really to develop that framework so we're now moving to step four of the framework of the five-step process and step four is to implement it so you now have your framework done you need to implement your competency model and in that implementation process, you've, you've finished your research, you've involved all the key members or leadership, you've selected the actual framework you want to use, 
and then you now have to ensure that it works really and start implementing. Yeah, so you've spent all this time creating that framework. So what is the implementation bit, I guess is what Yemi has, is already doing that now. And the, the yeah, re yeah. relevant competency framework, you've already chosen the, the relevant competency framework. You've, you've customized uh, the, the competency model to suit what it is you, you like. And then you also understand the critical data that is required. You, you, you know that already, and that's why you're now implementing, because you have full knowledge. Mm. So I think one of the main mm. things of implementing is even to train your staff, to kind of get them to understand how this whole thing works. So uh, how, how has that training been um, for you? That process of well, mindset next level changing. down. Mm. Yeah, it was the next level down after the HODs, after the engagement of the HODs. We now went into team meetings across the entire organization. And the interesting thing was that we got some feedback from the floor that helped us to tweak and refine the, the framework. So uh, we did that at some point um, in the course of the planning, the preparation, the communication. And now, before we implemented it, we went back to them again to let them see the final output that we we're going to be implementing. So again, that, that process of buy-in buy becoming very important because it will be, it might become a trust issue for HR if what was presented at some point has not been refined and tweaked and not communicated to all employees. So. The training was around, this is the framework now for the different areas of the business, and this is how where people are going to be measured, and this is how people are going to be developed. So we use for two things, performance also for learning and development. And it, I, I wouldn't say train, I would say communicate. Mm -hmm. In our own instance, we communicated the framework, the final output that we're going to be using for the entire business before we now started the implementation. Okay, excellent. And, and another thing about competency frameworks is it, it, there's a lot of sensitive information there. There's quite Absolutely. a lot of sensitive information. So how do, how do you create a privacy or privacy standard? So I think that's the next thing, as in to create a, a privacy standard so that people don't see what they're not supposed to see, so to, so, so to say. So what we did was we broke it down into the different business areas. Okay. So that, that helped. So the competency framework for investment banking might not be the same exactly for institutional sales. So what we're running by the different business areas were the, the part of the framework that related exactly to them. The only body, governance body in the organization that had access to the entire framework as a full uh, document was the Executive Leadership Council. Yes. So that, 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 that did not create any tension because yes, you're right, people are, people will be tempted for that department what is the framework for the other department? What department uh, like this? Why is mine like that? So we, mm -hmm. we, we tend to, we customize for the different areas of the business and the communication as well was specific to the different areas of the business. Yes. And again, this privacy is a very important thing. It's, it's uh, I don't know if the, the worldwide, I mean, people have so much information out there, but there's some critical information that you shouldn't show certain people. The staff, for example, mm -hmm. shouldn't understand, have their detailed competency report of another staff. I mean, that's his colleague. He's absolutely not mm -hmm. his business. He doesn't have to have that information. Just like payroll information, you shouldn't be sharing yep. people's payroll information around. So that's a key aspect mm -hmm. of the implementation. Mm -hmm. So, guys, we are up right. to the last stage of this five-step process now. After everything, you think, okay, we're done. We've implemented. So that's the end. But really, that's not the end. One very important thing we, step we need to follow is to measure. You need to track. You need to measure. I need to take action. So that tracking process is continuous. You don't just start today and end tomorrow. You need to have a regular evaluation. You need to have the individuals and department check-ins at, at regular intervals. So that's, that's constant checking or tracking and measuring has to happen every time. And you continue refining your measurement, pro, uh, measurement process, just like Yemi mentioned. You mentioned an excellent metric, which is the percentage of competency gap uh, closed versus the mm -hmm. training budget spent. I think that's an right. excellent, if you can have that measure, that's, <laughs> that would be so, 
So cool. And you refine it and you know it won't be perfect the first time. You continue refining, refining, refining. And then you know for sure that, look, why are we wasting money on that training? It never, ever adds to any competency gap. It doesn't close any competency gap. What's it for? It's a waste of money. So you save money and, and increase competencies in the process. And the only way to do that is to measure. You can never change what mm. you don't measure. I know that mm. for sure. So have individuals and department check-ins at regular intervals. And, and that's, that's key. So measurement, uh, Yemi, if we can have a chat around that. Okay, well, that's one, that's one area or last phase for me that I'm yet to, um, to experience. Yes, we have our plans in place, uh, but it will be at the end of this year. Remember mm -hmm. that what we have done is to determine the competency gaps for each employee at the beginning of the year, check in quarterly, and then at the end of the year, we're going to measure how well we've closed the competency gaps. And then you probably will throw up opportunities for, again, redefining and retweaking our competency framework. Um, it's a live door it should be a live document hmm. rather once you finish it put it in the, the save and that's it no what is the way at the end of the year like, like i said uh to that stage yet so maybe when we're talking again uh, sometime next year mm -hmm. early next year about this i'll be able to share some experiences uh, with regard to uh, our own specific situation yeah. yes so what I've seen really is from my own experience is uh, training for quite a long time. Training being a key part of competency, the whole competency framework, is we have this motto that we, we don't train if it doesn't add value. If it's not going to add yeah. value to the clients, we, we, we don't want the engagement. So mm. the, and, and one other thing we've discovered, especially for academies, we have companies that have very large academies for six months. Now, my own school of thought is this. It's a complete waste of money to put uh, 30, 40 people in one academy for six months where they're constantly almost going to school or redoing school because your brain just can't keep all that information. By the time they start work, I think 50% of whatever it is they've learned has disappeared. And then to add to that, at the end, they do one very large exam. And it's based on the actual performance in that exam that people are placed in various departments. And again, I think that, again, is not very accurate. So we've come up with a different model. And our, our model is one, we should reduce the number of days or weeks or whatever for any academy. We should reduce it significantly, definitely not six, six months to a year. And you break it up. So you, you kind of do, let's say, two weeks. And then you go, go and do some work for another two weeks, come back and do another two weeks, you do a, work for two weeks, come back and do another two weeks, getting what is being passed across. So you do a, a kind of a measurement. We kind of do 20 data points every day. So every single day of training, we gather 20 data points and measure every a single competency per data point. So those 20 data points we measure for each individual. We gather that over, let's say, 50 days. 20 data points for 50 days is a 1,000 data points. So by the time they finish their course, unintrusively, we have a 1,000 data points on each individual. And that 1,000 data points is mapped and charted and everything. And precisely, you know where people's strengths lie. And the most important thing is you place people where their strengths lie. So you've seen that this guy is competent in this. Place him in a role that requires that strength. So it's easier to put people <laughs> where their strengths lie than try and improve their weaknesses. So that's the model we've kind of built up as far as our courses and uh, academies are concerned. And I think it really helps a lot. It helps to, it, it helps our organizations reduce that competency gap because the competency gap is a big issue. If you, one is, is a big issue when you don't even know it exists. You don't even know there's a gap. So the first thing is, Identify that there's a gap and then do something about it. But some people don't even know there's a gap, which is so dangerous for any organization and very expensive as well. So I, I, I don't know if you have any last um, input uh, for us. Um, I, I think what I'll say is this. Um, we do a lot of talk around some initiatives or tools and I think um, that implement that we should develop and customize for organizations and it doesn't have to be expensive I mean there's this thing about keep it short and simple 
-huh. And then yes. if it is customized for the organization, we don't have to always buy off the shelf. Customizing it might mean um, a group of a group of people coming together and see what works for the organization. But I think it's just so important so that we're not talking in the air about developing people or talking mm -hmm. in the air about promoting people or talking in the air in terms of how we performance manage people. If we have a good competency framework in place, it allows us to do those three elements of, of HR very well. And also it leads to things that like reward. Then we are rewarding appropriately. So you are mm -hmm. getting the right sort of individuals. You are rewarding them uh, accurately. Your performance managing them, and then you are you are nurturing and developing them as well. So there's a there's a huge place for the competency framework within the space of HR. I recommend Excellent. it any any time. Nice, nice. And what I'm going to do now is something that is usually forgotten when it comes to competency frameworks. You see that you have these experts in HR, the ME included, that work do tirelessly work for like a year or two years trying to build a competency framework for the organization. And then they forget one thing, to build a competency framework for themselves, because they are also part of the organization. So they are kind of like, uh, you know, like a mother taking care of everybody and they forget to, taking care, they forget to take care of herself. So what I want to do now is really show a competency framework for HR and L&D experts. So we should also have our own competency framework and how we also build our own internal competencies so that once we raise our competencies, we'll be able to help others as well. So I'm going to play a short video from ATD. So ATD introducing their new competency framework. It's just a very, very short one point something, one and a half minute video. So everybody watch that. And then I'll show you another competency framework from another top organization. The ASTD competency model defines what T&D professionals need to know and do to be successful in the field. The last time the ASTD model was revised was 2004. So what's happened since then? Facebook was a Mark Zuckerberg creation that existed in his Harvard dorm room. Twitter didn't even exist. And it wasn't until 2007 that the first iPhone was introduced. Since then, many factors have triggered the 2013 revision. This includes the rise of digital, mobile, and social media, increased globalization, and shifting demographics. These factors have shaped the field over the last decade. Since 2004, the model has been simplified. It now has two major parts instead of three. The areas of expertise are the functional technical areas that are specific to the T&D profession. There are now 10. Learning Technologies was added as the 10th AOE in 2013. The foundational competencies, shown at the bottom, are the business managerial skill sets required for nearly all occupations. There are now six. Three were added in 2013. Specifically, global mindset, industry or sector knowledge, and technology literacy. Some key themes have also emerged. These included the importance of technology and using it well, the rise of informal learning, collaborative learning, and mobile learning approaches, and the importance of learning analytics. One theme continues to remain front and center, and that is, it's critical for T&D professionals to be business partners and business leaders. The Career Navigator, as shown above, is a related tool. It provides T&D professionals with ways to identify their own skill gap and ways to close them by providing a customized roadmap and developmental resources. The model also touches a number of ASTD programs and offerings, including the CPLP Certification Program, otherwise known as the Certified Professional in Learning and Performance. Updates to related programs will continue to take effect through 2014. So guys, we're back. I hope you enjoyed that video. So that was the um, ATD competency model. So ASTD is now ATD, which is, used to be called Association for uh, American Society for Talent and Development. And now it's called Association for Talent Development because it's pretty global now. And they have international conferences in the US where about 11,000 people go to. It's a very big body for talent development. But HR is too. HR and talent development are together, yes, but HR it has its own. So what I what I'll do is I'm going to share. Um, I'm just going to go online right now. I'll go to ATD site so you can see the sites, and then I'll also share one or two other things with you. So just have a look at uh, the screen. So I'd I'd encourage everyone to go to td.org. So td.org, as in td, and t for telephone, d for uh, data. dot org. O R G. And you'll be able to get lots of materials and stuff from a a ATD. Uh, I'm a member of ATD, and there's so much you can do there. And there's so many excellent courses for L&D and HR experts to go through. 
But then, of course, there's another body, and also they have a, a, their own competency model, and that is SHRIM. So this is SHRIM's website. So if you go to SHRIM's website, in fact, let me copy this link and put it on the chat for you guys. So anyone interested in clicking on this link can jump up to where I am. So I'll put the link on the chat if you click on the link. Um, so this is the competency model for HR experts, so to say. So um, Yemi, if you see this model, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, Yemi. Um, yes, I can, though it's small, but I can. Very small. I can okay, let, let me read it to you. So they have the stream competency model. They start with, to the right, with ethical practice. So ethical practice, then they have HR expertise. You have to have HR knowledge. Then there's business acumen is also a competency. Then critical evaluation, then global and cultural effectiveness, then leadership mm -hmm. and navigation then consultation, then communication, and then relationship management. It seems that HR experts have to be everything and everything. <laughs> so, yeah, remember I said to you that, I mean, we can't be coming up with all the initiatives in the HR space, and we're not able to sell it to the business. So yeah. selling and relationship uh, management skills will always be very important for HR. Yes. And the funny thing is you have selling experience. That's where you started from. You're a salesman. <laughs> and then you now went to become another salesman for two years. And then so no, HR is my passion, but you have sales in you. So uh, your, your skill sets are just wonderful. As in you have the exact skill sets needed for this. So uh, in fact, we're, we're very honored to have you. I mean, thank you very much for taking out your precious time to talk to us today. And we're so, so, so thank grateful. You, yeah, so grateful. And uh, for everybody, I'm sure you've enjoyed this uh, very enlightening experience talking to an expert like Emmy. And we would like you guys to join us again next month, the third Thursday of every month from 2 to 3. We try and bring experts on board to so we'll become guest speakers and we talk about interesting topics on HR and L&D and just to help move this profession forward in Nigeria and the rest of the world, of course. So we are D Brown Consulting. These are our details on the board. 0700 Training is our number, if you know how to call those smart numbers. Training at dbrownconsulting.net is our email. And our website, dbrownconsulting.net. And we also have an online platform where we have all our analyst courses online. We have it at officetraininghub.com. So you can go there right now if you want and get a free training, a couple of free trainings there. And we hope to see you again next month, right? And for those HR and L&D experts, we also have two other webinars we do on the same third Thursday of the month. We have the Excel and Power BI webinar. So that's always on the third Thursday from 9 uh, o'clock to 10 o'clock in the morning. That's Nigerian time. And then we have another one from 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock for financial modeling. So please get your guys to take advantage of this free, excellent quality course. And then, of course, you can also take advantage of our free uh, online courses on Excel and other, other topics. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. And we are done for the webinar for this month. We'll see you next month. And thanks a lot to Yami. It's just been an excellent host. Thank you, thank everybody. Thank you so much. Thanks, Yami. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, okay. Bye.